All right. Hi, uh, I'm Tom Scanlon. Thank you all for coming. Um, let's see, we're going to talk about 12-factor apps. I know that you guys already know everything about 12-factor apps, but we're going to cover it again with a focus on uh, our traditional administrator, right? We want you guys to be able to operate Kubernetes applications in the future because Kubernetes is a core part of what we're doing going forward, right? So my goal is to figure out how to help uh, our VI admins come up to speed on Kubernetes. And if you have any feedback, please come get me directly. And if you don't feel like it, you can always uh, leave detailed feedback in the, uh, in the survey results, right? Okay, so what we're going to talk about are the current and future state of the applications that we're all going to be running. Right? And then we're going to talk about adapting to the changes in, in the applications. And we'll talk about 12 factors and the 12-factor app methodology. And then we'll, we'll get out of here. All right, so a traditional application, these are the things that we run today or 20 years ago, right? It is what we are responsible for running all the time. And what has happened is, you know, we, do, we made these applications to be deployed on bare metal. And then later on, we adapted them to run on VMs. Um, and we really weren't thinking about how to make these applications scale across multi-cloud use cases. Uh, they aren't really super resilient, so operators have to do a lot to make that resiliency happen. And we generally, we, when we work with developers, you know, they develop these applications and kind of throw it over the wall, and then we have to run it. And that's the way things look today, for the most part. For, I think you, actually you could show your hands if. Do, you, do your traditional applications look kind of like that, like a VM running thing? OK. Well, in any case, 81% of our customers are going to be working with more than one cloud. Right? It's just happening. We're using SaaS all the time. We're using Amazon Web Services in tandem with our VMware services. All right. Also, by 2020, most of our customers are going to be building their own applications instead of uh, buying them, Right, so less COTS. Our traditional applications, right, look like this. You know, they're VMs, not, not multi-cloud applications. They're pretty simple. But our future applications are looking like that. That's what all of our modern applications look like, right? Modern applications are these more nebulous thing. Uh, they're made up of a lot of moving parts. Um, and they're, well, the next slide will tell you a little bit more. So a modern app is a resilient, multi-cloud supportive application, and it's comprised of orchestrated releases of containers, virtual machines, and serverless functions, probably also VMs, probably also some other things that we haven't heard about yet, like uh, maybe microkernels. Okay, but this is the way we're moving. And I wanna, okay, how many, how many of you write code at all? Like scripts, bash scripts, or power CLI, anybody? Okay, right? Those things are important, right? Developers write this stuff. This is the feature code, right? That's what brings the business value, right? We need to ship this stuff and make, make it run. But there are two other kinds of code. And chances are you write this kind of code, infrastructure code, right? We need the application to actually run somewhere, right? It doesn't ma magically just run. So we write all this code because governance is important. And then we have this other kind of code, this third type. So there's three types, feature, infrastructure, and reliability. Reliability code is the stuff that makes sure that the application continues to operate. Right? If it fails, we need it to restart. Uh, if it is having um, connectivity problems, we need the telemetry to help identify why that is the case. Or we need to identify where latency is really poor. Um, all right, so these are three types of code. And what I, what I really want to highlight here is this is in a modern application. This is what you will be doing. You're going to be writing more of this and more of this and working with developers on some of this maybe. Believe it or not, I, I see it in your future. You will be upskilling and you will be contributing in all of this area, okay? Traditional applications don't look like that, right? Today, you're probably in the state where this feature code gets tossed over the wall, you guys bundle it up, uh, and you didn't really care about the PaaS and the CAS. It's just running on IaaS. 
And also, all this reliability code doesn't exist. Maybe you're monitoring. You've got like Zen Monitor or something watching your, your VMs. Right? So how do we get from the other slide to that slide? Right? How do we adapt to the future? Well, here's your toolkit today. And what I want you to do, what I propose that you guys do, is imp improve your tool set, dude. Like, let's get you some better s tools so that you can run these applications better and you can sleep well at night because your applications can heal themselves, right? How do we help you do that? Uh, well, I want to help you understand what software as a service is and what 12-factor apps are because if you can start to create these things, you don't have midnight calls anymore. You don't have uh, weekend long update cycles, right? You begin to be able to operate more like a Google or an Amazon where your services are continuous and you can upgrade them in place and it's safe and reliable. Okay, so I want to talk to you about the principles of microservices so that we can kind of understand what these 12 factors are that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so principles of microservices, if you can develop with your developers and run all of your administration type of applications like a microservice, then you get all these things, right? You get an independence in your, the way you deploy and manage versions, all right? We don't really care about what language your application is written in. You can do it in Bash. You could do it in Power CLI. That's fine, right? We want automation. We want to make sure that all of the security infrastructure, operations, development, testing, all that stuff is automated, right? We want you to be able to push a button and have all the things happen, right? If you adopt some of these principles, your applications will be fail safe, right? They're gonna fail in ways that we understand. Uh, we can um, ha avoid single points of failure and, and you're, uh, you'll have some automated recovery, all right? Finally, you'll get efficiency. Uh, just, you know, your business capabilities are gonna improve. Uh, you, yeah, an application should have a single responsibility and it's going to hide the implementation details. You're going to package these things up and be able to compose bigger applications out of your, your smaller applications. All right, We're in, you guys have all heard of DevOps. Yeah, uh, anybody feel like you're DevOpsing well with your dev guys and your ops guys? Maybe, yeah, it's a, it's a transition. In any case, what I want you to do is keep in mind this dev cycle, right? I think you need to be doing your scripts this way and your management code, everything that you worry about day to day needs to go through this kind of DevOps cycle, right? You need to be working as a developer. All right, so now for the boring part, we're gonna talk about the 12 factors. Ba -ba -da -ba. All right, that's the slide you can take a picture of, um, but you can also just go to 12factor.org, 12factor.net, and you can get that. Um, and in any case, we're gonna run through each one of these, so let's do it. First, you guys have code. You've written some. Where do you keep it? Do you keep it in a repository like Git? Awesome. Uh, anybody use an SVN or CVS still? Perforce, anything else? If you don't learn anything else, learn Git, uh, G-I-T. Go learn how to use Git and use GitHub if you can uh, internally, uh, side by side with your developers. What we want you to do is have a single code base, right? So if you've got a, dev a developer driven feature code base, um, you know, this is the app that the developers have worked on and they ship it over to you. We want you to take their code repository and put your administrative code in the same repository, right? If you have code that you wrote to stand up the infrastructure, put it in with the developer code. They need to see what's happening so that you can both be working in tandem on the same code base, right? Because our applications are all three types of code, features, infrastructure, and uh, reliability. Uh, anyway, so we need to see all of the code all together in a single repository. Dependencies. Um, have you ever seen environments where you have one version of, I don't know, curl, and on a different server, you've got a different version of curl, and one, like the SSL stuff, just never works right, and the other one, it does? Well, curl is a dependency for your application, whatever you're working on. So you need to figure out how to get that version of curl 
onto uh, and associated with your application. You need to capture the dependencies in your code base. So when you have a, a Git repository, uh, you need some bit of code, or uh, maybe like a pit, uh, pip manifest if you're doing Python. Um, you need some way to version every dependency that you have and link it into your code so that when you deploy that to a, a new system, you have all of your applications all together with the right set of dependencies. Configuration. Um, so this is probably the one that I think might be a little bit lower on your radar. We, we need these configs to be shared in the application, but the way we do it in 12-factor apps is maybe different from the way that you guys might want to do it day to day. Um, in a 12-factor in a app, what we really want in a microservice, we want that configuration to be injected into the environment. We're passing in environment variables. And if you can do that, that is awesome. Uh, when you're moving to Kubernetes, you'll see it all the time. These manifest files have environment variables. And what you need to do is be able to compose those so that when you have different environments, you have different sets of configuration that map to those environments. And you can apply one environmental config on top of your application. All right, and that's critical. When I say it's maybe not one that you're going to hit on just yet, when you get to Kubernetes, you'll be doing this all the time. In, in the midterm, it's a little bit more difficult to figure out how to do this right. And there's a lot of config management tools that help you do that um, today. And I would encourage you to use those. All right, backing services. Um, anybody offer MySQL as a, as a service to any of your developers? Or do you provide any services to your developers so that they can consume um, an application? Anybody? Okay. In a lot of places around like VMware, we have things like Kafka as a service. Right? You need uh, some ingestion pipeline thing? Well, we'll stand up Kafka. We'll give you the VMs or containers or whatever, and you can just use it to your heart's desire. Right? That is a backing service. That is, it's something that we provide that ha is a stateful service, uh, right? like a database or a Kafka queue or a uh, yeah, messaging bus those types of stateful services, we want them to be swappable. Uh, an example of this would be, if your developers need a MySQL database, I should be able to give them a URL to a database that I host. Later on, I should be able to also stand up a DigitalOcean MySQL database, and they should be able to just swap the config, right? We just changed the config, now they're using the other database, right? If we want to switch over to using Amazon RDS, we just change one config item and they're using the new database, right? So these backing services, one of the nice things is if you follow some of these rules, everything that you write can then be a backing service itself. You can present yourself out as a consumable service. And that is one way that you can start to provide those services to your developers. Okay, build, release, and run. Right, so these are distinct steps. We need to build some binary that's executable. Then we need to release it, which just means mark it as a version, and associate some config with it, right? We've already talked about the config. That config is special to a particular environment. So when you build something, that binary will get used by many releases. And a release is aimed at a particular environment. So my test environment release is different from my production environment release. They're the same binaries, different config. Right, and finally, then there's this run step that is, again, distinctly different. Um, what you really would be awesome is you build, release, and the run step is really uh, at, at, at your decision. Right? You might want to just kill a container and have the new one. When it comes up, it's already got the latest release. It's got the latest config. Uh, and what, so what you should be able to do is like go turn off a VM and then your automated processes that spin up a new one should have the new version. All right, and anyway, um, processes. We want the application to execute as one or more stateless processes. We want to try to get away from state and push all that state into a backing service, right? Work really hard to get those backing services good and, and correct, uh, but let's make our applications dumb, all right? The, the reason we want to do that and get away from state is because it allows us to scale in a, a better and safer way, right? When we no longer have to worry about, um, you know, 
the application fitting in one compute resource, uh, we can now horizontally scale. We can spin up five more VMs, and I can put my application on those five VMs, and they share the load. Right? So it, this also is a, another area where sometimes developers in the feature code start to get really clever about um, writing scaling into their application. But in reality, that should be your control. You should know how to scale because you know what hardware it's running on, you know what the infrastructure looks like, whereas the developers don't. And I, if they try to get too clever in this area, it's taking the power away from the operator. Okay, port binding. This is just, let's expose um, some sort of interface on a particular port. All right, usually we're talking about REST APIs, but it could be gRPC, it could be, you know, like Telnet or uh, SMTP servers, right? You can still Telnet into the SMTP server and say hello and stuff. Uh, that's all port binding is, right? We just, we don't necessarily want you as the developer to specify what port you want to expose, but as an operator, it's your job to like pick that port and assign the application to that port so that other services can connect to it, right? And this is what gives you that access to do, um, uh, create your own backing services, right? When you control that port binding, you can now expose your service as a backing service to others to consume. All right, concurrency. Uh, so this is like how you scale out, how many, um, we want these applications to be stateless and your process model is gonna follow the Unix model because that's the best model. Sorry, Windows guys. Um, let's see, 12 factor app arch architectures handle all these different workloads using different process types. All right, we'll talk about a web type process or a worker type process and we, we want those different types of processes to scale independently of each other. All right, disposability. We want to just be able to kill and fill these types of applications. Uh, shoot them in the head, throw them away, whatever you want to say about them, uh, but you must be able to um, kill your process and feel safe about doing that. Um, things are going to die all the time, and if you develop your application in such a way as to handle that failure safely, um, yeah, that's, that's the best thing you could do. All right, dev and prod parity. We talked a little bit about um, uh, your dependencies, right? This is directly related. We want to prevent environment drift between different in environments, right? Uh, we know that if you deploy code uh, to one VM and you've got one version of Ubuntu and you deploy it to another VM, it's got the right version of Ubuntu, but you deploy it to production and you're like one minor version off on your Ubuntu image um, and your application dependencies break. Right, so we, we really just need to make sure that uh, the, all the environments that you deploy to look as similar as possible. Uh, logs, De developers shouldn't be worrying about things like uh, where to send logs. They should never think about syslog. They should always just write to standard out because uh, you as operators, what's going to end up happening is you're, you're, well, you're probably doing it today already. It's log aggregation. You're probably pulling all that stuff into a central server to do analytics. And uh, as we get more and more into a container world, um, this becomes really important. And in fact, I want to make sure that the things that you write also log to just standard out and that when you are logging, you should be able to capture the, those administrative kind of tasks. You should be able to capture those logs into a central system. If you're operating on the command line, those things still need to get back to the central logging server so that you, you have a way to know what happened. All right, finally, uh, admin processes. All right, so these are the things that you run. Sometimes you gotta go in and do like a, a vacuum on your Postgres tables or something, right? So there's a one-off command that you have to do occasionally. What I'd really love you to do is make that an application, right? And then uh, be able to run that application sometimes, right? Just as a one-off process. But if you can't do that and you have to do a manual one-off process, at least do it inside of a Docker container that is exactly like the environment that you would normally run it in, right? So we want to make sure that that admin process happens in the exact same environment as the code that uh, will be running when it's in production. Okay. I think that is 
pretty much it. So my last call to action for you all is understand that you are a developer, whether you want to be or not, and in the next 20 years, you're going to become more of a developer. And we think of these 12-factor apps as like the other developer concerns, but those three types of code, most of it is in your purview. You have two-thirds of that code is your code. And all of those 12 factors, more than 50% of them are things that you are daily concerned about. So I think the 12 factors really are important to you. Um, if you want, there's an application here that is intended to be like an experimental thing, something that's easy to understand, so you can get your hands into it and play with Kubernetes or Docker or other things. But it's a simple app that just helps you understand some of the moving parts, uh, and it's developed in a 12-factor style. Finally, it's not on the slide, but I really want to hear the feedback. All right? If you didn't understand some of this, or if you think it could come across better, just let me know in the survey results. Uh, and otherwise, reach out to me. My name is Tom Scanlon, and I don't have a slide that says that. But just come up after. Okay, my goal is to help you. All right, thank, thank you a lot. <laughs>